Okay, well, good morning. Thank you for coming uh, so early on a, on a Wednesday morning. When, uh, when Dr. Davies asked me to talk about the congenital heart disease guidelines, I, I said, yeah, sure, not realizing at that point they were 180 pages long. So uh, you'll be glad to hear I'm not going to try. I, I think there are two ways to do this. One is to try and race through 50 lesions with a table for each and have you remember nothing. I, I'm actually going to, I have, I've taken the liberty of changing the title a little bit, and I'm going to give you a, something of a commentary um, on certain aspects of the guidelines and things that, that I thought were interesting or important. So everybody loves guidelines, 100% wholesome goodness. They tell us what to do when we're really not sure. But without wishing to be too cynical, um, there is, there is a, a value to guidelines. None of us want to be this guy rushing in where fools fear to tread. And equally, we don't want to be unreasonably therapeutically nihilistic. And I think guidelines help, help us steer a pathway between uh, these two extremes. And we do, we do do some good. And when you look at a, a common lesion, Tetralogy of Fallow, we clearly see that over the, the cohort era from 1930 to 1980 birth cohort, there is a very steady, very progressive improvement in, uh, in survival, um, which is down not just to surgical expertise, although a lot of it is, at least in the early years, but is also down to expertise in pediatric care and subsequently in adult congenital care. So these patients, as you all know, are fixed, uh, but they are rarely cured. We know that, the patients don't always know that, um, and that leads to some interesting uh, conversations at times. The guidelines use the traditional structure um, of strength of recommendation and quality of evidence. Uh, right now I have to warn you that the quality of evidence in adult congenital heart disease is pretty poor. We have almost no randomized data to support anything that we do, and much of what you see uh, will, or will see is supported by expert recommendation or non-randomized data at best. One of the things I liked about the, uh, the current guidelines is that they've moved away from a purely anatomic classification of disease complexity. So traditionally we've referred to lesions as being simple, such as shown here, uh, moderate and, and complex, and I'll show you examples. Um, one of the things I'd like to point out is just how few lesions there are in the simple category. So sometimes we talk about easing our workload by offloading the simple lesions perhaps to cardiologists outside of the institute, but we have to recognize that's actually not going to do us much good in terms of workload, because there are really very few truly simple lesions in congenital heart disease. The bulk of our work are these lesions, the moderate lesions, um, and even here the term moderate is a little bit of a misnomer, because a, a category that includes sinus venosus defects, which are basically straightforward and easy to manage, with Epstein anomaly, which is my personal nightmare diagnosis, um, that those are not equally moderate. And recognizing this, uh, the, the guidelines have now uh, in, incorporated an aspect of physiology on top of the level of anatom anatomic classification. So now we, uh, as well as describing lesions as mild, moderate, or severe, we also describe their physiological state as class 1, 2, 3, or 4. Class 1 and 2, as you would imagine, is fairly mild. Class 3 or 4, though, includes things like hypoxemia, cyanosis, liver dysfunction, renal dysfunction, um, arrhythmia is refractory to treatment, and as we get into the more severe stages, um, severe pulmonary hypertension and really refractory end organ dysfunction, which often for our po patient population means liver, severe liver dysfunction or severe renal dysfunction. And the guidelines illustrate uh, the, the usefulness of this with uh, an unrepaired AST, two, two patients with unrepaired AST. The patient on the left hand side, patient one, has a shunt but he's only having occasional palpitations. He doesn't have a lot of tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, sure, he needs to be repaired, but he's not, he's, not in, uh, he's not in a difficult position. Whereas the patient two has already got persistent atrial fibrillation, he's developed severe pulmonary hypertension, and he has moderate TR. Now, those two patients are very different in terms of management strategies and, and ease with which they can be managed. Um, and according to the level of physiological overlay on the anatomic lesion, we have uh, some direction about how, how often we should be seeing these patients, imaging these patients. There's, uh, there are a few paragraphs in the guidelines about access to care, and I, I wanted to say something about this because I think that this is something we don't talk about enough and is a massive problem. 
So I like this. Physicians caring for patients with ACHD should support access to care by assuring smooth transitions for adults and young adults from paediatric to adult providers. Sounds, it's motherhood and apple pie. Who could, who could disagree with that? I don't disagree with that. But the reality is that this is what we often see. In pediat pediatric hospitals, they are very well looked after. Every cardiologist is basically a pediatric cardiologist. There are many of them. They're on AFPs. They're not having to generate billings. And so the pediatric patient and their family get used to a very focused level of care and often get quite a shock when they come to the adult side. That's assuming that they make it to the adult side. So there are real challenges, I think, for every adult congenital center in, in North America about how we deal with transition. Very often we don't have enough staff on this side to really cope with the numbers that are transferred. And uh, there, may be a, there may be a lack of, of uh, people with, it, with sufficient expertise. So in Canada, there, it's very difficult to find Canadians who want to do adult congenital heart disease. So in, in 10 years in Toronto, we probably had 40 fellows of whom I think three or four were Canadian. Um, so Toronto General have just employed three new adult congenital cardiologists, three. All three are from London, from the Royal Brompton, because there was nobody local. Vancouver can't recruit. So there is a real workforce crisis. Um, and that's really not surprising when we, we look at our remuneration models. It's going to be very difficult to provide adequate ACHD care when we have a, a, a fee-for-service model that rewards procedural activity but not outpatient activity. And so there's a gap. There's a gap. And I don't think any, anywhere really has worked out how to close the gap. Um, even uh, Toronto, which would regard itself as a model of perfect adult congenital care, uh, was having problems a few years ago. So this was a study where they looked at a cohort of patients who had finished at sick kids and were referred to the general um, for transition. And they defined a successful transition as patients being seen within two years of being referred to be seen. And all of them should have been seen actually within one year. But over half of them didn't get seen within two years. And that led to some major changes in the way transition was arranged in Toronto. So I think we're, we do our best, but we are probably still losing patients as they cross from the pediatric side to the adult side, and the bridge is still a little bit wonky. There's work to be done. So uh, the other thing that I thought was a bit disappointing about these guidelines was really there are no recommendations. No recommendations to help us go back to our bosses, chief executives, and say we need some more support. No recommendations for staffing levels. Uh, either uh, medical or, or nursing, no recommendations for nurse practitioner infrastructure or other infrastructure. And I think that was a missed opportunity. Just to remind you that congenital heart disease isn't rare. We often, people often think it is, but it isn't when you compare it to other diseases that are much better known, much better publicized, much better funded. And there's a real uh, change in demographics that's been occurring in the last 20 years so that we are seeing now we have more adults than children alive with congenital heart disease. And we're seeing increasing numbers of patients getting older, more outpatient visits, more inpatient hospitalizations, and the burden on the healthcare system is going up. We uh, apologies to anyone in the room who's over 60, but this, there's now a new specialty of geriatric ACHD. 60 is geriatric for us. Most of our patients are 20 or 30. Um, and you can see that this is just one, cent, uh, one center's data from London, but you can see there's been an, uh, a dramatic increase in the number of patients over 60. There's been a 12-fold rise in patients with simple lesions, but a six to seven-fold rise in patients with moderate or complex lesions, all of which is testament to how well, in some ways, we're doing keeping these people, keeping these people going, but it, it creates challenges. And so, faced with the, uh, the oncoming tsunami, all we can do is smile, dress up for work, and go in and do our best. And uh, some, sometimes I think my colleagues are superheroes, but the, the real superhero, the only one I really know is Joanne Morin, sitting here in the second row, who's our nurse practitioner who really does the work of three. Um, so thank you, Joan, for everything that you do for our service. This is how we feel like most days, but uh, in, enough whinging. So um, in terms of the evaluation of congenital heart de disease, the guidelines have quite a bit to say. Um, I think uh, everybody is already doing ECG, echo, and cardiopulmonary testing. And there are some, some guidelines for how often to do this, depending on complexity and physiology. But I was pleased to see that there were reasonably strong recommendations for cross-sectional imaging, which I think most of us agree is really now the mainstay of at least moderate and complex uh, disease follow-up. 
CMR remains the, the, perhaps the, the primary tool, and that's partly because of its flexibility. It's the most accurate tool that we have for following right ventricular size, for quantifying regurgitant shunts, um, for looking at residual obstructive lesions, examining the pulmonary arterial and aortic anatomy. Uh, for all these reasons, MR, it remains the primary tool. Uh, anybody know who this is? Yeah, that's Sean White, the snowboarder who has tetralogy. Um, but I was particularly pleased to see that cardiac CT uh, is, is gaining a more prominent place in, in the guidelines. And you might say, well, why do we need CT when we've got MR, if MR is so good? And the answer is that we don't always have patients in hospitals where MR is available. Patients are admitted to peripheral hospitals. They have a CT service and decent CT readers, perhaps, but no, no experience in MR. It's also very good when the patient is claustrophobic or sick. If you've got a sick patient, the last place you really want them is in the MRI scanner. And CT, we can get a lot of the information very rapidly. And it's, it's essential when the interventional cardiologists have been attacking our patients and putting in Gian Turco coils, and you can see there's big holes in these MR images caused by tiny, these, I've blown this up, but these are tiny, tiny little coils made of stainless steel, and they cause big problems for us, whereas CT can resolve that area with no problem. This is an example of a, uh, what I'm meaning about a, a sick patient. This was a patient, uh, a tetralogy, pulmonary valve replacement, who was sick and un unstable, didn't want to put them in the MR scanner, and so ran them through the CT scanner. You can see this thickening of the pulmonary valve consistent with vegetation. There's a, uh, an anterior mediastinal abscess, and there are even abscesses in the chest wall. All of this information is achieved in about five minutes in the CT scanner. And um, we've recently published several sets of guidelines in the Journal of Cardiovascular CT detailing how CT may be used for congenital heart disease moving well, below, well beyond simply using it to image coronary arteries. The guidelines also touch on mental health, um, and that's a big problem for our patients. You know, you've, if you've met our patients, you know that they have mental health issues, many of them. Some of them are developmental, some of them are syndromic. Um, and one of the things I, I usually do is, is take some kind of psychiatric history from the patients, not just from the patients, but from the families or, or the families themselves, or family history at least. Um, one of the things you're screening for is increased incidences of depression, schizophrenia, or suicide. So certain patient groups, particularly the tetralogies um, and some of the transpositions, so the conotruncal disorders, mm -hmm. they have an increased uh, risk of 22Q11 deletion syndrome. Uh, if you see a right aortic arch in a congenital patient with a conotruncal abnormality, always think of 22Q11, and that can cause problems with uh, calcium, platelet dysfunction, immune dysfunction, but certainly depression, anxiety, and suicide. And so it's nice to see that the guidelines are, are reminding us that this is an important part of care. Heart failure and transplant. Sharon's here, that's good. So heart failure and transplant. This is a bit disappointing, really, uh, I think. Um, the single biggest problem, there are two, two, the two single biggest problems we face with complex congenital heart disease patients as they get older is systemic ventricular failure and arrhythmia. And heart failure and transplant needs to be part of the management of this patient group. In the past, we've tended to say, nothing can be done, that's too bad, sorry, well, you know, your, your life is coming to an end. And I think increasingly centers are refusing to accept that as a final option, and I think that's right. I think many of these patients should be considered for transplant. The problem is, and the guidelines say, consultation with ACHD and HF specialists is recommended uh, with ACHD, HF, and severe ventricular dysfunction. Well, it's, it's easy to achieve consultation. It's not always easy to uh, achieve a consensus on management. I think it's fair to say that many ACHD specialists aren't really very au fait with transplant. It's not really what, what our expertise is. And I think it's probably fair to say that some transplant doctors don't really understand ACHD. And there needs to be a common bridge uh, that allows the two sides to talk to each other in ways that both understand. So one of the, one of the possible solutions um, is to establish an adult congenital heart failure clinic. And there are so, some centers which have adopted this model with input from both, both teams. Um, it takes a little bit of time for the teams to adjust to working together, to be honest. But in places where it's been going for a few years, I think I've seen definite improvements in the way that we look after complex patients approaching transplant. But it's not just about cardiologists, because many of our, our uh, patients with systemic right ventricles have got problems with chronic venous stasis, they've got a lot of liver dysfunction, 
um, liver cirrhosis in many cases. And we're also seeing, and we're increasingly seeing, Fontan patients presenting with hepatocellular carcinoma due to chronic venous stasis. So there are lots of specialists who need to be involved in these patients' care, including interventionalists and electrophysiologists, because perhaps if we can open up a blocked collateral or dilate a pulmonary artery or do something to improve pulmonary blood flow or stop the incessant atrial fibrillation, then maybe that patient doesn't need transplant just yet. And we can prolong them a little bit further, keep them going before we have to do the inevitable. If we don't do all these things, we're only left with this. Um, and as I say, that's, this is something that we, may, we do still sometimes have to do, but we're increasingly trying not to make this our first option for patients with uh, end-stage congenital heart failure. And so the guidelines say this, discussion of end-of-life issues, advanced directives can be beneficial for patients with ACHD or their surrogates. Um, and that's true, and I suspect that we are perhaps not much better at doing it in the ACHD world than people are in the adult world. And when Daniel Tobler was in Toronto, he looked at this in a cohort of about 200 patients uh, of all sorts of severity and found that patients were very keen that end-of-life discussions be held, even amusingly those with very simple lesions, <laughs> but fair enough. Um, but when you looked at, and when you looked at those, uh, what healthcare providers thought, they, they also agreed, uh, you know, as you would expect, the worse the lesion, the more the healthcare provider thought you should discuss end-of-life. Uh, but when you ask the patients, uh, how often someone had spoken to them about end of, end of life, uh, the patients almost invariably said nobody had ever said a word to them about it. So there may be a disconnect between what we say we do and what the patients think we do. Um, and uh, there's some room for improvement there. So since uh, there are about 50 lesions spoken about in the guidelines, there was no way in 15, 20 minutes I could go through all these lesions um, and I think that's not the purpose of this, but I wanted to, to pick one lesion that wasn't uh, too arcane, if you like, something that we'd all be like, likely to see, even if not in congenital practice, and just use this as an example of how the, the guidelines are appropriate. And I think coarctation. Coarctation is a good example because uh, it's easy to think that a, co a fixed coarctation is, is done, you know, there's nothing, nothing more to worry about. Um, and that's not really the case. And I, I quite like the guidelines for coarctation because I, th I think they're thoughtful in terms of what they talk about. So first of all, they talk about the initial diagnosis and follow-up imaging. And I'll, I'll show you some examples. Um, and the importance of blood pressure management in coarctation patients. So many coarctation patients have problems with persistent hypertension. Some of that is just due to resetting of, of uh, baroreceptors uh, and the treatment for that is going to be aggressive medical therapy. Some don't present with hypertension at rest, but are hypertensive on exercise. And the guidelines suggest that we exercise test people to bring out concealed hypertension. That's something that I regularly do. And again, there's a, there's a big role for imaging. This is a patient who was believed to be a simple bicuspid valve and was just referred for a, a quick ov overview. And somebody noticed that the, the pressures in the lower legs were uh, different to the pressures in the arms. Um, and uh, uh, MRI shows why echo had really failed to pick up what was going on. So the usual site of coarctation is a bit abnormal, but it doesn't look particularly tight. But as you come down to the mid-thoracic aorta, there's a, a really quite significant lesion at that point. And that'd be difficult for echocardiography to recognize. Drug-resistant hypertension. Um, some patients just are drug-resistant, and we have some patients on two, three, and occasionally four drugs. If you get to that stage, uh, the guidelines would suggest that it's worth having another look at the aortic arch to be sure that there's not something causing obstruction. So this patient, for example, just has a generally small aorta and there's nothing to be done about that. But these three patients all have very hypoplastic aortic arches. And so if you've got somebody with severe hypertension and an arch that looks like this, there may still be a role for surgical intervention. Most of these are not stentable because these are not focal discrete lesions, these are tubular long lesions, and you're not going to be able to expand you know, the, this kind of lesion with a stent. But there may be role, a role for an extra anatomic bypass, for example, from the ascending to the descending aorta. So it's important not just to accept things as they are, but to periodically go back and reevaluate and make sure that you have fully evaluated. The guidelines also say that it may be reasonable to uh, image coarctation patients with MRI to look for berry aneurysms. Now, I think this is a, a little bit historical in the sense that in the early 
natural history series, that there were patients who died not infrequently from berry aneurysms. Uh, the thing is, though, in these early natural history studies, a lot of these patients were being diagnosed with coarctation in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, so they'd had many years of aggressive hypertension, uh, which probably predisposed them to form and to rupture. I have to say that in 15, 15 years of ACHD, I've yet to see a coarctation patient with either a berry aneurysm or a ruptured berry aneurysm. So I suspect it's not as common in the contemporary cohort. Nonetheless, the guidelines say that it's reasonable to do it. I would say about 50% of us do and 50% of us don't. There doesn't seem to be an excess of deaths amongst the patients of those who don't. This was a study from the Mayo Clinic done a few years ago now where they looked at a, a, 100 sequential coarctation patients and did MRI of the circle of Willis on all of them. And they found 10 uh, berry aneurysms Mostly they were very small, like this, two or three millimeters, and they found one eight millimeter aneurysm. So out of a hundred, they, they operated on one patient and, and undoubtedly caused considerable anxiety in, in nine. So that's the trade-off when you go looking for trouble. Um, this is something I do screen for. Uh, so patch aneurysms are a problem with people who've had coarctation repair by subclavian patch. Again, it's important to remember that just because somebody's fixed, it doesn't mean that there, aren't, that there isn't the potential for problems. We see this less now that end-to-end -end anastomosis is the standard of care, um, but it's, it's worth looking for, and you don't even need to use MRI to do this. Uh, but if you do the chest x-rays, you do have to look at them. I have seen some patients with 10 years of chest x-rays with an aneurysm that's slowly expanding that obviously nobody has actually ever bothered to look at. So every time I wonder whether we're actually doing any good or whether guidelines are, are worth it, I'm, I go to the literature and I'm reassured to see, this is uh, Quebec administrative data from Ariane Morelli, who's done a lot of work in this area. Um, and she looked at the effect of patients being seen in referral centers versus non-ACHD referral centers. And using an administrative database showed that there was a favorable outcome on mortality if you get seen in a in a referral center. And that's true even for severe, perhaps sp specifically for severe congenital heart disease. In fact, the only uh, variable that was associated with uh, a favorable hazard ratio for, for death was being seen in a national or, or a regional referral center. Similar data, again, from Ariane Morelli, looking at the effect of guideline introduction for ACHD care uh, back in 1996, which was really the first time we had some proper published guidelines. So the guidelines were presented in 96 and they were published a year or two later. And when you look at the referrals to a specialist centre, you can see there's a clear inflection point uh, around that time with a 7 to 8% increase in referrals. And a small lag phase, but what looks like a, uh, an almost significant 5% decrease in mortality overall. So this is not randomised, this is inferential, but there seems to be some suggestion that patients referred to specialist centers for ACHD care do better, particularly if they're complex. And that shouldn't really come as a surprise to any of us. So I'll finish by saying that whenever I go to clinic and think, oh, this is all a bit bleak, these patients are difficult, what are we going to do? Um, I'm reminded that the, the men and women whose shoulders we stand on uh, faced much greater difficulties and uh, didn't give up. And I don't think we should give up either. So. In 20 minutes, which is really no time, I, I just wanted to say to you that I think the guidelines have actually genuinely improved care for patients with adult congenital heart disease. These new guidelines, take a look at them. If you've read the old guidelines, I, I don't think you're going to find a lot has changed, really. These new guidelines are incremental rather than revolutionary. Um, there's almost no randomized evidence for what we do, and undoubtedly some of what we do now may be shown to be harmful in the future, as is always the case. And guidelines like any kind of guideline, these guidelines should be regarded as a living document rather than a tablet of stone. They're clearly going to evolve in the years ahead. And with that, I'm happy to take some questions.